Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're glad to see so many faces, new faces, old faces. It's always exciting. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing myself. My name is Jordan Tofigi. I'm a member of ERI, and I'm also a student here at the CIS. Um, and before we begin, and before I introduce Adrian, I would just like to give a little rundown of how the evening will unfold. We have refreshments in the back, so please help yourselves. Adrian will be talking for about an hour or so, or so, uh, and then we will take a 10 minute break. You can help yourselves with refreshments. Uh, we have restrooms in the hallway um, on your way out. And we will start up again with a discussion with Adrian and Peter Eng. Peter is a doctoral student here at CIS, and they will be having a dialogue afterwards. Um, during this time, we will open the floor for questions, so please do stick around. Okay, so um, on my way here from camping, I was in a little bit of a rush and I was trying to make it here in time. Scrambling around, I got a text message from Larry saying, hey, can you, uh, can you introduce Adrian? And I thought, oh boy. It's always hard to wrap up uh, in two minutes someone like Adrian who has so much to offer and so many gifts and holds so much. Um, so I, I thought about a few things that I could share and um, I'll do my best. Adrian um, has been an incredible peer. I have gotten to know him more and more in the last two years, more so since uh, we began working together on Erie, since Erie was born last year. And uh, he's just incredibly uh, inspirational. His courage, his dedication to his work, as you will see, his passion. It's been a, a great opportunity to work side by side with him. Uh, many of you might not know that Adrian was um, an addict for 22 years and um, he will be celebrating his 15th year clean this year. And to top it off, it's Adrian's birthday tomorrow. So please give a warm welcome to Adrian. Testing, yeah. testing, can you hear me? Yeah. Is this good? Yeah. Not too loud, not too soft. It's good. What fool gave me this podium? <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So, my name is Adrian, I'm a doctoral student at EWP. And I knew what my dissertation topic would be years before I came here because it is the story of my life. Um, this particular, the idea to speak and give this particular talk came uh, a few weeks ago when, um, it's a very difficult month for me, we, Larry and I just got finished doing a bunch of writing for the upcoming Cambio newsletter which will be out in the fall. And then I realized that I was going to have to move uh, this month, and, and I'm poor. And so I was getting very stressed out, and I began to observe, uh, you know, the reappearance of some old symptoms that I equate with my uh, addiction. I said, just look at this. So I'm under some pressure, and these are coming up for me. So what's that all about? And I was thinking about that, and I was reading, of course, and I came across something or other that sparked an idea. Uh, and, I, and I thought about it for a while, and I decided um, that it might be the case that addiction could be best characterized as a complex in Jungian terms. Can you turn this down just to hear more? Thank you. Um, so let me 
So that's why I'm talking about the psychodynamics of opiate addiction because I'm proposing, you know, a, a psychical uh, structure, uh, a dynamic that is responsible for addiction. And it's treatment with evil gain, of course, so the reason for this is very simple. I was a heroin addict for 22 years. They just about killed me. And at the last possible second, uh, when I was not more than two weeks from the grave, uh, I was able to, to do evil gain and it saved me. <clears throat> I mean, I had to do a lot of work after that, but um, it's pretty extraordinary. So, um, and thinking about it, I've decided that, I mean, why is Ibogaine so effective at the treatment of opiate addiction? Others as well, but it's, it's best performances with opiates. Um, and in collusion with the concept of addiction as a complex, um, a complex, we'll get to that. So it, the evil gain is a multivalent key to unlock this frozen complex of addiction. So let's let's get rolling here. Uh, if I could just figure out how to. Ah, <clears throat> so since I'm in the process of working to get my hall pass for the academy, I have to begin by acquainting you with some fundamental background material so that you, the listening people, can make your own assessments about uh, whether or not you think I've reached reasonable conclusions based on the information I give you and like that. So first off, I'm a qualitative researcher, not quantitative. And so the road to validation for qualitative researchers is principally, not exclusively, through transparency, and that's why I'm telling you about all of this. I am a fourth wave psychologist, by which I mean I live in an ensouled universe. Uh, fourth wave psychology includes transpersonal and integral and Frankel's logotherapy, at least. Uh, all of these have some things in common, and they are that, uh, that uh, so, uh, and I'm also coming from a a background, a spiritual background of uh, a Vedic orientation. So um, I was a Vaishnav before, and now I've become a, an Aurobindonian in terms of the philosophy and yoga. So I live in an ensouled universe, uh, source, which is a term that I'm using, a generic term for God or the absolute. Uh, is pure spirit, and everyone and everything is made of it, that is, there is nothing that is not God. Spirit is conscious, but not self-reflectively so. That's our job. Higher realms of consciousness are available to us. You only have to read Groff and people like that to know this. Humans are bipartite beings, wherein the psyche and the soma are coextensive, so that consciousness affects our bodies, which we know as the psychosomatic connection. So we've mentioned, these are some of my academic credentials. The real credentials that I have to give this talk is that I was this addict for a long time. Uh, and I tried to get out of it for 17 years. I went through 14 different treatment programs using virtually every modality uh, utilized in the mainstream of the recovery industry, uh, but relapsed every time. <clears throat> Finally, I was saved at the last moment, as I say, uh, by treatment with Ibogaine. Now, in my case, this was with Dr. Mash on the island of St. Kitts. Dr. Mash was actually conducting human clinical trials as part of her effort to get it legalized for the American Pharmacopeia. Um, and so I was actually a research subject but Dr. Mash knew full well that she was also treating me. Ibogaine is an addiction interrupter. It's not that I took the Ibogaine and then I was forever cured of addiction. I had to do a lot of work thereafter. But unlike any of the other treatments, it not only completely interrupted the cycle of addiction uh, without any suffering, uh, leaving me with no desire to use whatsoever, it also mm, purged and purified my entire uh, energetic body, as well as my physical body, and uh, imbued me with hope and uh, reconnected me to my spirituality. It did many things all at once. I went back a year later for a second dose, 
I was able to meet plant, plant teacher a second time. Uh, later, I helped to form an Ibogana integration circle in North Miami Beach, which is where I went to a treatment center. It was recommended by Dr. Mash when I left the island. Um, and she recommended it to everybody who had the opportunity to go there and didn't have to go right back home. And it partly served her purposes because she wanted to continue collecting data from us. And it's close by where she works and lives. So she could do that. Um, but it gave me a chance to meet several successive waves of Ibogonauts coming back from the island thereafter so that we could share experiences. And uh, could you turn this, the lights down just a hair, please, Larry? Um, I coined the term Ibogonaut myself. Dr. Mash really liked it, so it stuck. I was thinking of Argonauts because we ventured to sail on uncharted, stormy seas, facing the demons and monsters of the deep psyche in order to win the golden fleece of a freedom from addiction. So I've had innumerable conversations with addicts, both in use, both while using, and in recovery. And I've had many conversations with other Ibogonauts so that my own personal experience is enhanced by these conversations. And my story can be found at that, uh, it's actually a blog site, it should be a website, but it was easy and quick. Uh, my story is there and you can read about it in greater detail, if you wish. This material is, of course, a small piece of my upcoming dissertation. Tonight I will not be talking about these various other areas that will be part of my dissertation and, of course, form a more comprehensive matrix uh, for the information I'm about to present. Uh, but I want you to perhaps get an idea about where it's coming from by seeing what will be around it. <coughs> this is kind of a natey natey process of finding out what I'm talking about. I will now be talking about a review of Sri Aurobindo's scheme of the stages of the involution of source to explicate the fundamental nature of human beings. However, I state elsewhere that my impression is that integral, his integral psychology is the ideal way of looking at the problem of addiction in human beings because of our multidimensional nature, and which corresponds perfectly with the description of Sri Aurobindo. I won't be talking about Rupert Sheldrake's morphic fields as a basis for discussing the energetic characteristics of human beings and our relationship with source, how we fit in there. I won't be talking about a comparison of the perspectives of the various fourth wave psychologies on addiction and entheogens. I will not be talking about a medical anthropological introduction to the traditional practices of energy medicine, which are Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, and of course the shamanic healing traditions. I will not be talking about the cultural anthropological discussion of, in, of socially inherited factors that generate and maintain addictions. I will not be talking about the sociological consequences of addiction uh, and, and the comparison that I will be making between addiction and other disruptive social phenomena that have received a lot more effective attention. And of course, I will not be giving you a background on the use of Ibogaine in the Bwiti cult, where it comes from, or its research history in the West. That will all be in the dissertation. Um, when I say multidimensional, I'm sure everybody here, being in San Francisco, must have a grasp of the various energetic fields uh, of our body. And I don't really, I don't do that that much, so I don't have them down. But there's, um, you know, the, the astral body and the subtle body and so forth, where our, our vital energy and our uh, psychical energy and our intelligence and so forth are all located in these different layers. Just remember that each of us, the, the, little, the body in the middle there is the physical body that we see, but we all are generating, are, are part of an energetic field that's much larger than us. If you've read Castaneda, you know, he talks about uh, floating energetic eggs within which the person is situated. And the, uh, I just scarfed this off of Google Images, but the, uh, the branching 
at the bottom kind of conveniently fits in with Aurobindo's scheme of how we arise out of the inconscient. Uh, we are like the a conduit between the inconscient and the superconscient. But I won't be talking about that tonight. <clears throat> this is a, a frame that I took from uh, the slideshow I prepared to go with my talk at uh, the Erie Conference where I spoke specifically about the treatment of addiction in general with evil gain, for focusing more on the evil gain. These are all the things that evil gain uh, is capable of doing in a single session. The one that I have highlighted is the one that we're going to be focusing on tonight. Here is a section scheme. Uh, there are copies of this available if you want to like make notes on it or whatever. This is what I'm going to be talking about tonight. That'll help me you, and you. Can you go back to the last slide? slide come on. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, undoubtedly it's possible. Uh -huh. For me, on the other hand, I am not a... I, I don't want to interrupt you. I, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to do that, frankly. Does anybody hit just tell me? Hit the left arrow. Left arrow? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Well, uh, undoubtedly, I could print copies of this as well if you're, if you're interested. We can make the slideshow available on our website as well. Um, right. This is being video recorded and eventually, right. Thanks to the technical efforts and the hard work of our, my fellow Erie members. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get going. So, the talk is entitled The Psychodynamics of Opiate Addiction because I am proposing a Jungian complex as the best way of framing the phenomenon of addiction and its treatment with evil gain, which is a multivalent key to this disorder of multidimensional human beings. Okay. I assert that addiction is an extreme expression of the soul sickness affecting individuals comprising modern Western society. It is a disease representing the existential problems of people living in what Ken Wilber calls flatland, in reference to his four-quadrant scheme of reality, where the two left-hand subjective quadrants of existence are denied by the materialist establishment. Addicts are examples of what happens to people in what Martin Buber calls our I-it society, rather than an I-thou one. They perceive themselves to be victim objects rather than doer subjects. The outward-directed, non-self-reflective nature of our culture and society is mirrored individually in these people for the lack of awareness in their own internal state. Here are six views of addiction. This is not necessarily exhaustive um, that I came up with. The last two of which I think I came up with myself. Uh, addiction as a spiritual emergency, as a crisis of coex. Stan and Christina Groff have this to say in Stormy Search for the Self. Drug and alcohol dependency, as well as other forms of addiction, may in many cases may be, in many cases, forms of spiritual emergency. Addiction differs from other forms of transformative crisis in that the spiritual dimension is often obscured by the apparent destructive and self-destructive nature of the disease. During addiction, many difficulties occur because the quest for the deeper dimensions within is not being carried out. Alcoholics Other addicts describe their decline into the depths of addiction as spiritual bankruptcy or soul sickness and the healing of their impoverished soul as rebirth. Addiction as an impromptu rite of passage. Bill Plotkin has this to say in his book Soulcraft. In Western cultures, we rarely enter the underworld except when abducted by a great loss or depression. Then the descent can be harrowing indeed as we enter a blackness we fear we won't escape, we 
have no guides or allies, no preparation or relevant skills, and few inner resources to call upon, we're not likely to enjoy the journey. But we may yet benefit from the experience. Better to be carried off than not go at all. Abduction is the soul's way of pulling us down toward it if we will not voluntarily step through the gates and over the edge. In order to resolve this challenge and survive, one must enter a process of examining the self, the world, and one's assumptions and expectations, or contracts, as Don Miguel Ruiz frames it, that have been forced upon us in the course of enculturation. Intense revolutionary passages in our world afford similar effects, but addiction is more personal. It results in a breakdown of routine for the egoic self under the increasing pressure of a disjunction between one's behavior and psychic state and consensual reality. Only self-examination can release one from unconscious reflexive responses to negative messages and an inappropriate self-image that one has acquired through misinterpreted trauma. Called or not, the God will come. The addict will experience such a crisis if they live long enough. Addiction as an escape from the world. Addiction entails an implicit philosophical stance of self-negating nihilism. This view supports the addiction as a perverted search for transcendence perspective, in this case as a sort of Kabbalah Advaita Vedanta, an attempt to annihilate the ego and merge with the oceanic bliss of Brahman. Addiction as a socially transmitted disease. Gabor Mate says in Hungry Ghosts that a person can survive being beaten, but cannot remain psychologically intact if he convinces himself that he was beaten because he is by nature blameworthy or because the world by its very nature is cruel. The greatest damage done by neglect, trauma, or emotional loss is not the immediate pain they inflict, but the long-term distortions they induce in the way a developing child will continue to interpret the world and her situation in it. All too often, these ill-conditioned, implicit beliefs become self-fulfilling prophecies in our lives. We create meanings from our unconscious interpretation of early events, and then we forge our present experiences from the meanings we've created. Unwittingly, we write the story of our future from narratives based upon the past. Rollo May said in The Discovery of Being, is not neurosis precisely the method the individual uses to preserve his own center, his own existence? His symptoms are ways of shrinking the range of his world in order that the centeredness of his existence may be protected from threat, a way of blocking off aspects of the environment that he may then be adequate to the remainder. Of course, I've selected all these quotes because each of them uh, speaks to some characteristic of addiction. Brent Courtright said in his book, Integral Psychology, the primacy effect of childhood experiences in our family creates a profound and lasting imprint upon our psychic structure and self-image. Neurologically, these early experiences create neural networks that are strengthened over time. These imprints and neural pathways, in fact, are so strong that they are modified only under certain conditions. They cannot be deeply modified merely by cognitive techniques, for this only affects the surface self, and leaves the more deeply held structures of the self untouched. Real fundamental change to the self structure needs to be a deeply emotional experience, just as the original conditioning occurred in a deeply charged atmosphere of intense affect. F. David Pete says in Blackfoot Physics, sickness has its origin in ideas. A virus is information. The immune system recognizes the pattern of an intruder and manufactures antibodies that act to destroy viruses and bacteria. At the level of an individual, disease could be thought of as a battle between systems of information. This image also applies at the social level because the conditions under which viruses mutate and are passed on, as well as the conditions under which human immune systems become debilitated, are the direct result of social conditions. Disease is a manifestation of human thought because it's ideas, worldviews, and beliefs that create the conditions in which a society can be riddled with disease, strife, and poverty, or can continue in health and harmony. 
<clears throat> Timothy Leary says in The Politics of Ecstasy, ego attempts to turn itself off through anesthesia, unconsciousness, fast suicide or slow narcosis. Have you ever talked to an articulate junkie? The appeal of heroin is the void, the warm, soft cocoon of nothingness, surcease, easeful death, the vacuum gamble. The game of the junkie is to nod off, to pass over the line into unconsciousness. It is of interest that the heroin addict and the illuminated Buddha end up at the same place, the void. The junkie is a deeply religious person. The alcoholic is too. Thus our physicians and psychiatrists have no luck in curing addicts. If you see an addict as a social misfit, a civic nuisance who must be rehabilitated, you completely miss the point. To cure the junkie and the alcoholic, you must humbly, this is still Timothy, you must humbly admit that he is a more deeply spiritual person than you, and you accept the cosmic validity of his search to transcend the game, and you help him see that blackout drugs are just a bad methodology, because you just can't keep holding the off switch, and that the way to reach the void is through psychedelic rather than anesthetic experience. The addict as crucified scapegoat. This is purely my own idea, although it's supported by Gabor. Truly, true, they laboriously cut down their own tree and fashion their own cross from it, which they struggle to drag uphill to their own Golgotha as their habit consumes them. But it is, a, it is society that actually crucifies them by driving in the nails of legal chastisement and shame, holding them up as examples of the lowest you can fall. As they hang from their cross, addicts are further humiliated by the attitude and comments of lawyers, probation, and parole officers, their boss at the lowly jobs they must take in order to appear rehabilitated, and the endless paperwork they have to constantly fill out to get so social services, wherein they must declare themselves pitiable by virtue of their helpless and degraded condition. Already driven to addiction by their despair, Society then constantly piles on further indignities. This virtually guarantees that detoxified addicts will relapse and return to using in order to escape their unendurable pain. This perspective is also held by Mate, though without the mention of crucifixion. <clears throat> Addiction and archetypal influences. The appearance of the archetypal dark angel, angel of death, uh, a little glitch here. You don't know about that. I had that experience. Can't get into it right now. <clears throat> the appearance of the uh, angel of death signified that I had effectively already bottomed out in death, lacking only the physical conclusion of physical death. The roar of the cataract signaled the final plunge. Some archetypal images and influences that cluster around my big turning point, you can read about this in my story if you, if you follow that line. Archetypal images that uh, cluster around my big per turning point in sequential order are the Angel of Death, Jason and the Argonauts, or a specific form of the hero's journey, Wounded Healer, and archetypal Plutonic characteristics. Mythic themes are the underworld and hell, symbolic representations of the repressed instinctual dynamism within the underworld of the psyche as described by the Freudian id and the Jungian shadow archetypes. All of these views are valid, but none of them are complete. Although elements of each are found in all to one extent or another, I now propose what I believe to be the essential core and functional cause of addiction. So now we're, where it says thesis, addiction is a complex. I have long contemplated the old disease of addiction label. I suppose I should mention that um, after Ibogaine treatment, um, I had been saved and was uh, temporarily, for a period of time, in a very teachable modality and buoyed up by the long-lasting presence of Noribogain 
the ibogaine metabolite that lasts for a long time in your body after treatment. It was a window of opportunity, but I had to take that and begin uh, the usual work of recovery in earnest, or when the the hand of plant teacher was removed from underneath me, I could just fall right back into uh, my addiction. In fact, there was a young fellow who treated right next to me. He was one half my age and had been strung out one third as long. And tragically, he is no longer with us because he relapsed and died uh, four years later. So I did everything. I used a scattergun approach and did a lot of things, including the 12-step program, which was of great use to me. And for about five years, I did just what they said, went to a meeting every day, did a lot of service, and so forth. Uh, eventually, I stopped going as much. Now I go occasionally, because the steps are archetypal and thus infinitely interpretable. But the fellowship is kind of locked on a certain track, and that track is they're oriented towards benefiting especially the newcomer. This is good news for the newcomer. It's great news for me when I was a newcomer. And it lasted for, you know, it was about five years before it started not being all that supportive for me anymore. And I began looking for my sources of recovery uh, elsewhere. And for a time, I thought, oh, there's a problem uh, with the program. I went to both NA and AA. Uh, primarily NA, but I, I did a lot of time in AA too. And I thought, uh, this should be changed because I perceived that it held people back when they were trying to move on. I don't think that anymore. Uh, but one thing I had a problem with is the disease of addiction label. Certainly it is true that there is much dis-ease uh, resulting from it, but I had two reasons for wishing to find a new formulation. One is that the word disease connotes the medical model and its mechanistic perspective. This view of life and illness arises from the reductionist materialist paradigm, which I strongly feel must be replaced with a holistic spirit-based paradigm if we are to survive or to speak of evolve. The other popular connotation that is associated with the disease label is its connection with the 12-step program. I regard that program as very helpful though not everyone does. Furthermore, the concept of once an addict, always an addict, though denied in principle in NA at least, is in fact maintained there by the conduct of the fellowship in meetings. This has the worthy effect of minimizing challenges to the newcomer, but tends to convince members that they can never escape their addiction. This position implies that recovery is in actuality remission. The Oxford English Dictionary offers many definitions of remission, of which 5B is a medical one. Quote, lessening of the severity of a disease or symptom, disappearance of symptoms or cessation of the activity of a disease for a period. Holding this implicit interpretation gives rise to a popular comparison in the fellowship between the diseases of addiction and diabetes in which attending a daily meeting will stave off the effects of addiction just as taking a daily dose of in insulin to stave off the effects of diabetes. Thus, addicts believe they will always be sick, will always be less than normal citizens, and will have to attend 12-step meetings for the rest of their life. This, however, is not my experience, nor does it honor the power of conscious contact, as described in the 12 steps. So I feel the time has come to find a new term that better describes the genesis and state of addiction than disease. I considered the term syndrome because it describes a condition for which the cause is unknown, so it is described by listing its primary and secondary observable characteristics. However, Meg Jordan, the chair of IHL, informed me that syndrome is also a term strongly connected to the medical model. I considered disorder but realized that addiction typically entails several more clearly defined disorders, such as OCD, attachment disorder, depression disorder, and others among its elements. 
So while addiction disorder wouldn't be incorrect, it would necessarily be less detailed in its description of addiction than the description of each of the various disorders common to this psychiatric condition. So I have come to consider Jung's description of a complex as being the best representation of the disease of addiction, which is fundamentally a psycho-spiritual illness. When it manifests as substance abuse addiction, naturally there are many biological consequences and thus it becomes a psychiatric illness. <clears throat> I assert that addiction is definitely in the class of psychosomatic illness in that bodily distress both results from the condition of one's psyche and in turn reinforces the affliction of consciousness and emotion. <clears throat> Let's take a look at Jung's perspective on complexes. For the sake of this brief report, I rely primarily, primarily on Murray Stein's book, Jung's Map of the Soul, in Introduction. Stein says, As a virtual center of consciousness, the ego is innate. But as an actual and effective center, it owes its stature to those collisions between the psychophysical body and an environmental milieu that demands response and adaptation. These collisions may be catastrophic and lead to severe damage to the psyche. Then the nascent ego is not strengthened, but rather injured, and so severely traumatized that its later functioning is radically impaired. Infant abuse and childhood sexual traumas are examples of such psychic catastrophes. From these, the ego is often permanently impaired in its lower psychic registers. Cognitively, it may be able to function normally, but in its less conscious parts, the emotional turmoil and absence of cohesive structure create severe character disorders and dissociative tendencies. Such egos fragment easily, un fragment e easily under stress and therefore tend to resort to primitive but very powerful defenses to wall off the world and to protect the psyche from intrusions and possible injury, such as a bag of dope, for instance. Such people cannot trust others. Paradoxically, they are also constantly let down and seriously disappointed by others and by life in general. Gradually, these people isolate themselves from the environment, which they perceive as overwhelmingly threatening, and they live out their lives in defensive isolation. This passage describes the preconditions for addiction to become entrenched in the individual, and the developmental process of the addictive complex, with its own set of defenses separate from those of the ego complex. The addictive complex leads its own independent existence in the unconscious until it becomes activated or constellated in Jungian terms. Quote, when we say that a person is constellated, we mean that he has taken up a position from which he can be expected to react in a quite definite way. Complex reactions are quite predictable once one knows what the specific complexes of an individual are. What it means to be constellated ranges from being slightly anxious to losing it and going over the top into madness. This is Stein speaking. When a complex is constellated, one is threatened with loss of control over one's emotions and to some extent also one's behavior. When constellated, one is as though in the grip of a demon, a force stronger than one's will. This creates a feeling of helplessness. Even as one watches oneself becoming the witless victim of an inner compulsion to say or do something one knows should be better, left unsaid or undone, the scenario unscrolls as predicted and the words are said, the deed's done. An intrapsychic force has been called into action by a constellating situation. Which speaks to what I said my impulse for creating this talk was in the first place when I felt these old things coming up under the impact of an increased stress level in my life. Jung also framed the development of complexes in terms of quantum physics. A charge of given strength and characteristic, like spin for subatomic particles, is discharged into the field of consciousness, both increasing its field strength and imparting a direction. This eruption occurs when a complex is triggered by events, whether internal, external, or both. Quote, the complex's energy refers to the precise amount of potential for feeling and action that is bound up in the magnet-like core of the complex, 
the complexes have energy and manifest a sort of electronic spin of their own, like the electrons surrounding the nucleus of an atom. <clears throat> when they are stimulated by a situation or an event, they give off a burst of energy and jump levels until they arrive in consciousness. Their energy penetrates the shell of ego consciousness and floods into it, thereby influencing it to spin in the same direction and to discharge some of the emotional energy that has been released by this collision. When this happens, the ego is no longer altogether in control of consciousness, or for that matter, of the body. So in case you've lost track, what they were talking about is the collision of the ego complex with a complex that is emergent from the unconscious. <clears throat> this concept of the magnetic core of the complex is important, and we'll return to it shortly. <clears throat> Finally, um, Stein, most people's egos will normally be able to neutralize the effects of complexes to some degree. This ability serves the interests of adaptation and even survival. If one could not do this, the ego would become dysfunctional just at the moment of greatest danger when keeping a cool head is most desperately needed. That's the end of the quote. But being out of control is the essence of addiction. Walking into danger yet again with a sense that you can't stop despite knowing full well the dangers entailed by your actions. This brings a sense of doom. One feels oneself to be at war with the cosmos with almost every hand turned against you. Stein says, in addition to personal complexes, there are also family and social complexes. <clears throat> well, these are important uh, to the social aspect of addiction, but for want of time and space, we're not going to go into them here now. <clears throat> Let's look instead more closely at Stein's account of Jung's description of the elements and configuration of complexes. Stein begins this in his section entitled Psychic Images. The complex is an image, and as such, belongs essentially to the subjective world. It is made of pure psyche, so to speak. The complex is an inner object, and at its core is an image. <clears throat> Complexes are products of experience, trauma, family interactions and patterns, cultural conditions. <coughs> These are combined with some innate elements, which Jung called archetypal images, to make up the total package of the complex. Complexes are, in a manner of speaking, constructed human instincts. These features of the image, its inner coherence, its wholeness, and its autonomy, are important aspects of Jung's definition of the complex. A complex possesses psychic solidity. It is stable and endures through time. Left in its own space without intervention or challenge by ego consciousness, a complex tends not to change very much at all. I will return to Stein's psychic images when discussing recovery from addiction. Now, what is Jung's view on the development of complexes? In a section entitled Personality Fragments, Stein says, the integration, incidentally, this Kat Stein is a Jungian analyst of like 30 years. Right now he's teaching and doing research at the Jung Institute in Zurich. Uh, so he's intimately familiar. He's read the entire collected works more than once, <clears throat> which I haven't, so I'll use him. Uh, <clears throat> Stein says, the integration processes normally active in the psyche, have been thwarted by severe, usually sexual, childhood trauma. Complexes are, as a rule, subordinated to an integrated ego, and ego consciousness is maintained when a complex is constellated. In general, the complexes have less energy than the ego has, and they show only minimal consciousness of their own. The ego, in contrast, has considerable energy and will at its disposal, and is the primary center of consciousness. But, the traumatic experience becomes part of the core of a complex, which accretes more elements until the normal energetic relationship between the ego complex and others is disturbed. This is like the formation of a pearl in an oyster. 
the annoying little grain of sand that has gotten into the soft body of the oyster, the oyster begins to secrete mother of pearl around that to protect itself. And so the pearl grows over time as layer after layer of this mucousy substance accretes. And that's more or less the, the building process of a complex. And the initial grain of sand is the two-part core of the complex. What influence does a complex have on an individual? Stein says, being in complex is itself a state of dissociation. Since complexes possess a type of consciousness in their own right, a person who is in complex is in a sort of possession by an alien personality. And the other complexes seem to have a separate purpose and will. Often this is in conflict with what the ego complex wants at a particular moment. This sounds remarkably like an out-of-control addict fully in the clutches of their head. <clears throat> Now I want to examine the construction of complexes more closely. I believe this is very important. Okay, so Google Images. <laughs> Nobody has uh, drawn an exploded image of a psychical complex. So we're going to use this much more typical exploded view uh, as an analog. In the center of this carburetor, this is a carburetor, taken apart, and this is the core of it. I picked this particular exploded view because the core, as you can see, has two main parts that are nevertheless welded together. Everything else, so that would be, in Jungian terms, the <laughs> welding together of a frozen traumatic memory with an associative archetype that that trauma is congruent with. They become welded together, and then the interpretation of the archetype is frozen in place by that traumatic memory. Over time, the so-called gravitational force of the core of the, uh, the core of the complex attracts various other elements, um, dissociative behaviors, various other disorders. I mentioned a few of them. Depression, anxiety, uh, free floating, fear, OCD, things like that. Things that are very common. Would you mind, it, uh, it, would, help, it would be helpful to me if you just illustrated a, an example. You said a, a traumatic incident with an archetype with the welding together. That uh -huh. would be just a kind of a garden variety example of that. Um, I'll be happy to answer that, but later. Um, we'll be taking... About 10 minutes. Oh, no. no. I have a lot more than that. <laughs> if I'm going to get anywhere near through this, uh, remember that. Write it down. I'll be happy to answer that later. Well, it's already been mentioned. Um, childhood sexual abuse, for instance. An incident of sexual abuse is devastatingly traumatic to a small child. Mm -hmm. And um, the only way they can deal with it is package it and put it aside. And it becomes, and, and as human beings, we, we uh, carry a retinue of uh, archetypes that are available to us. And one of them that's in resonance with that particular frequency of damage uh, locks to it, and then they become a complex. Uh, <clears throat> right. Jung describes the uh, structure of the complex as being made up of associated images and frozen memories of traumatic moments that are buried in the unconscious and not readily available for retrieval by the ego. These are repressed memories. What knits the various associated elements of the complex together and holds them in place is emotion. This is the glue. Remember that. That's very important. Emotion is the glue that holds these complexes together in a ball. Furthermore, the feeling-toned content, the complex, consists of a nuclear element and a large number of secondarily constellated associations. So that's all the other crap around the two-part core. <clears throat> 
The nuclear element is the core image and experience on which the complex is based, the frozen memory. But this core turns out to be made up of two parts, an image or psychic trace of the originating trauma and an innate archetypal piece closely associated to it. The dual core of the complex grows by gathering associations around itself, and this can go on over the course of an entire lifetime. And the other piece of the complex's nuclear core is archetypal. The archetypal elements in the personality are innate dispositions to react, behave, and interact in certain typical and predictable ways. They are inherited and not acquired. Not only the body, but also the soul, the psyche, is specifically human and creates the preconditions for all later experience, development, and education. We can... Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm only on page 11, I got 25 pages. <laughs> okay, bear with me, I will sort of jump, make some little jumps here in an order in the object of moving ahead. In Soul and Death, which is a, uh, an essay in Jung's uh, Psychology and the Occult, Jung says, nervous disorders consist primarily in an alienation from one's instincts, a splitting off of consciousness from certain basic facts of the psyche. So, that's how I could, every day, go down into the ghetto and risk all the dangers I knew only too well, including the possibility of sudden death, every single day, even though I didn't want to, uh, because I had no choice. It's being out of control, and that's extreme dissociation. Mm. Uh, hence, rationalistic opinions come unexpectedly close to neurotics, and like these, they consist of distorted thinking, which takes the place of psychologically correct thinking. The latter kind of thinking always retains its connection with the heart, with the depths of the psyche, the taproot. So the distorted thinking is what Alcoholics Anonymous uh, called stinking thinking. So, uh, I'm a bright boy, I tried to think my way out of my addiction for 15 years or so, didn't do a thing just made me worse. We see that psychologically healthy attitudes towards the self include a sense of wholeness and of self-worth, self whereas the attitude of a typical addict towards themselves is one of worthlessness and of incompleteness, derived from inappropriate messages imbibed during, the, uh, during their life, most commonly in childhood. These disturbing messages are out of harmony with the individual's natural instincts, but are unwittingly accepted because the, of the personal and or social gravitas of the person delivering the message, often a primary caregiver or an important conduit of enculturation like a teacher or a minister. I'm going to try to do some... Okay, an important corollary of this situation is the loss of or difficulty finding in the first place one's sense of meaning in life. When one is raised in the ontological container of the reductionist paradigm, wherein all of reality is described in terms of random collisions of particles, no conceptual ground exists upon which to stand where one can construct a meaningful schema that might explain one's existence and purpose in the cosmos. The lack of such a scheme results in an existential vacuum, as Frankel terms it, created by the absence of a personal sense of meaning. I think it's illuminating to see that he discovered that of his students, 25% of the Europeans experienced existential vacuum, but 60% of the Americans did. Frankel said, the fact that the existential vacuum is more noticeable in America than in Europe is due to the exposition of the average American that should said exposition, of the average American student to indoctrination along reductionist lines. 
the cultural climate that is predominant and prevalent in the United States, states makes for the danger that this compulsion becomes a collective obsessive neurosis. <coughs> so we go on here with the, I do want to touch on ego game. So, uh, okay, so there's a bunch of other stuff. More arguments about <clears throat> in support of why this complex is uh, an effective. It's all important, damn it. <laughs> You're going to have to buy this. Go to the website. Hmm. Let's talk again about the archetypal element in the two-part magnetic core of the complex. Schoen offers his view on addiction as a Jungian therapist who has dealt with addictive clients. He was not, however, an addict himself. I applaud him for emphasizing what I feel to be fundamental features of addiction that others seem to have missed. However, I disagree with his theory about the archetypal element of the complex. Oh, okay, I'm going to skip that. Uh, this cat, Shun, uh, was also basically accepting the, uh, the complex concept, but he posited that the archetypal element was uh, archetypal evil. And he's obviously a Christian because he kept referring to it as Satan and things of that nature. And I hmm. he's a, he's, he said he does many he says many good things, good observations uh, about addiction, but I, I have problems with some of his conceptualization. Uh, for instance, he says, a psychological addiction truly takes possession of the person in the deepest and most sinister sense of being possessed. I do not use this term in merely an imaginal or metaphorical sense. And, and he follows by saying, the definition of psychological addiction has two key components. First, the addictive substance, activity, or behavior must ultimately take over complete and total control of the individual psychologically. And the second part of this definition is crucial. The addiction takes over control in an inherently destructive and ultimately life-threatening way. It is not an addiction unless it is a death sentence. So if you're asking yourself what is the difference between addiction, drug addiction, and uh, substance abuse problems, that's it. Uh, when you know you're killing yourself, finally, and that, that takes us a long ways into your addiction because, of course, the addict tells themselves all kinds of stories, rationalizes this, that, and the next thing. Plus, we can't see ourselves the way others do. It takes a long time. Eventually, if you live that long, you realize that you're killing yourself. And you still can't stop. Okay, so jumping ahead. <clears throat> hmm. And yet, Schoen's power of observation as a good therapist has captured the ambiance of the addictive scenario. The unreachability and untouchability in addiction is clearest in the sad and disappointed eyes of husbands and wives, daughters and sons, families and friends, as they watch in desperate, absolute futility their loved one drifting hopelessly, sometimes slowly, but inevitably, into a walking death until the addiction takes them out of their misery and everyone else's too. You can see it too in the eyes of men and women who are drowning in addiction, as their focus fades further and further away into some distant place, distant unseen place, that they distractedly always seem so antsy to get to, but never do. Well, so I, I skipped uh, several things here. So uh, this, my summary statement on addiction theory is, uh, you can see that this affliction is complex. There is little consensus among the many disciplines that address the topic regarding even its definition, 
or to speak of its characteristic development, its consequences on the people affected, or its dynamic relationship with society. Trying to assess what is going on in an addict's mind by observing their behavior is like trying to imagine what the experience of a person taking LSD is like by watching what they do. Not only that, addicts are notoriously untrusting and manipulative. So generally speaking, only another addict can get anything like a straight answer from them. I believe that only a multidisciplinary approach is capable of encompassing all the dimensions of the addictive complex, and only an integral psychological lens can fully comprehend the psycho-spiritual aspects of its annihilating impact on an individual. However, I feel the Jungian formulation of complexes does provide an adequate model to explain the observed and reported psychodynamics of addiction. For its core, however, I postulate instead an archetype that, in my experience, instead of Jung's archetypal evil, uh, an, an archetype that, in my experience, is widespread amongst addicts, that of abandonment. My inspiration for this first came from considering the source of addiction in my parents, who were both alcoholics, and I discovered that both had suffered from this painful experience as small children. I also feel it corresponds with the thesis of existential devastation advanced by John Furman in his book, The Primal Wound. There he clarifies that if an infant does not see itself recognized as a separate entity and nurtured nonetheless, it suffers the existential angst of non-existence. <coughs> if one must have an ultimate aspect to the core archetype of the addictive complex, I ask you I ask you to consider the ultimate expression of abandonment, abandonment by God. This is tantamount to being cast out, relegated to the outer darkness. This notion is supported by Gabor Mate's thesis that society has painted the addict as its scapegoat, which is then driven out into the wilderness, carrying the sins of the people. Okay, moving along to entheogenic treatment of opiate addiction. Theogens are consciousness expanding and emotionally enhancing, while addictive drugs are consciousness narrowing and emotionally deadening. Opiates in particular are taken to withdraw from a painful life by medicating one's feelings and narrowing one's focus to the immediate need of procuring one's drug supply. Clearly, the actions of entheogens and opiates are diametrically opposed. Um, I'm going to skip this. I just bitch about the legal situation. The government is painting uh, white to be black. Okay, Vincent Rabelais is a French author and journalist who has traveled to Gabon for initiation into Guiti shamanism and has returned a number of times for more advanced indoctrination into the use of iboka or the plant substance from which the alkaloid ibogaine is extracted. Ravalek says, Iboga is not a drug, nor an entertainment. It is first and foremost a key uh, <clears throat> that gives access to other areas of being, of the world, and of consciousness. One thing that I can say with certainty about addiction is that one's conscious horizons close in more and more with the passage of time and the development of one's habit until you're living in a box. Mental flexibility approaches nil, and your behavioral routine becomes as invariable as a phonograph record's grooves. Evil gain can lift one out of the old grooves of entrenched thought patterns to provide a much broader perspective of oneself and one's life. Remember that Jung referred to the feeling-toned complex and said that emotion is the glue that holds the associated disorders together. Also, the gravity of the core of the complex, which is in essence frozen trauma, is based on devastating and unendurable emotional content. <clears throat> this is what tightly holds the whole assemblage in orbit around the core. Ibogaine has the capacity of enabling a review of traumatic passages in one's life, but with the emotional volume knob turned very low, so that a journeyer can revisit such episodes in a relaxed and more objective stance. Thus, one's consciousness is not torn by overwhelming emotional stress, and they can now see more clearly what happened to them 
when and by wh where and by whom, the abnormal way in which they reacted to the stress and how they colluded with their fear and hurt to prolong the abnormal reaction past the removal of the original damaging stressor. I consider the feeling toned complex to be a kind of Gordian knot. Alexander the Great solved this seemingly intractable problem of this complex knot by cutting through it with his sword, or in other words, by finding a solution outside the box. I suggest that ibogaine is a key that can unlock the frozen feelings that glue the manifold subproblems of addiction into a complex, and that plant teacher has the ability to lift one outside the box they originally constructed to protect and hide themselves, but in which they are now trapped. Agnes Peischler says, the body and mind, about Ibogaine, the body and mind begin to function differently in response to Ibogaine. The root invokes clairvoyance, it is said. It operates an inner work of reflection and personal introspection. Through visions, the initiates make a voyage towards birth and towards death, then towards the world of spirits. This sort of process is exactly what addicts need. They have been frightened children, avoiding looking into the closet where the monsters live and running fearfully from them. But as adults, we know that when the light is shown into that closet, the child can see that the monster was just some clothes in the shadows. A child in, sus a child in suspended animation is at the core of every addict. Peace, baby. Uh -huh. Frozen in their fearful stance. Actual trauma is in the history of every addict, which of course is not going to change. But Ibogaine has the power to promote a reinterpretation of events that can enable the addict to open their box, peek out, and begin to revision their perception of life, of the cosmos, and of themselves. Let me clarify a difference between Ibogaine and other entheogens. Peichler says, visions are at the center of Bwiti and differentiate Iboga from other psychoactive plants. While he or she is visualizing, the subject stays centered. He perceives reality around him normally, without any distortion linked to his imagination, without illusions or alteration of thinking, without depersonalization. He always remains conscious and continues to be himself. There is no intoxication. The visions that superimpose themselves on reality are gener generally less aesthetic, less visually developed than the hallucinations can be, but they have a much more personal content. And the visions, the waking dreams, may connect the individual to his memory and to his subconscious, both of which are connected to collective memory and collective subconscious. They all dredge up and relive personal images and events from the recesses of the memories that have been forgotten, many of them from childhood. This is exactly what addicts need to dissolve the fearful emotions that glue together the feeling-toned content of their addictive complex. Regarding the visions, Chilean psychiatrist Claudio Naranjo, who used ibogaine and iboga as therapeutic adjuncts on occasion, termed them onirophrenics, or dream makers. This reflects the character of ibogaine visions described above by Peichler. Naranjo says, of the content of experiences elicited with evil game. It can be said that archetypal contents and animals are prominent among the visions, and the actions involved in the plot of dreamlike sequences frequently involve destruction or sexuality. With evil game, anger is not directed to the present situation, but rather to persons or situations in the patient's past, toward whom and by which it was originally aroused. This is in accord with the general tendency for the person under evil gain to become concerned with childhood reminiscences and fantasies. I said earlier that the emotional volume knob was turned down, not off. One must be able to distinguish where and when one responded irrationally to negative stimulus in one's dreaming recollection of early abuse and other damage suffered in childhood. Vincent Ravalek says, Iboga, and this is one of the specific features distinguishing it from ayahuasca, forces you to go back into your memory, your own memory, but also really into the memory of the species. Iboga inspires thinking, which is not like ayahuasca, where you go off on a colorful trip. With Iboga, everything is highly structured, and this also implicates the mind. 
And, he further says, I think that one of the differences between iboga and ayahuasca is that with iboga, you are really going to touch this in depth. In other words, iboga is truly going to peel you apart, almost cell by cell, and is going to read your memory. Ouch. Again, this kind of operation is just what is needed in order to deconstruct a frozen complex and thus to finally free the addict from the chains of the unconscious, fearful behavior that has taken over their lives. And I will mention that in Bwiti, in the native culture where uh, the sacred medicine comes from, uh, it's very much part of an ancestor cult and their ancestors uh, it also connects you with the forest and with the soil and Mother Africa. And, of course, the bones of their ancestors are buried in that very soil. So it's a very inward and downward, it's a root. And it takes you down into Mother Earth and connects you back to the ancestors. But the first stages of that process are your own childhood memories and like that. Consider this important consequence. If the frozen traumatic memory that is half the core of the addictive complex is reinterpreted so that much of the fear associated with it is dissolved, then that gain will be magnified by virtue of being able to revision the archetypal half into a new and less terrifying interpretation. Archetypes are endlessly malleable and are always with us, so one that had been conjured in one of its more frightening aspects could now be befriended for its revelatory bounty. Conclusion. Much more can and should be said about the use of Ibogaine in the treatment of addiction, but I hope that this brief sketch has been enough to clarify some of its many qualifications for this challenging task. I believe that the inherently multivalent treatment available through the use of sacred medicine, one that enlists the help of the spirit realm, is one of the best ways to help addicted multidimensional beings to escape the trap of illusory fear and reclaim their fabulous birthright as a human being.